This is a new video on infrastructure development. It's part of the sequence 4.3.3, Interventionist Strategies Influencing Growth and Development. Say what it is. So what do we actually mean by infrastructure? Infrastructure is social capital. It's used by entrepreneurs to produce and then supply the goods and services that we want to consume. Infrastructure is also used by households. For example, households use clean running water, electricity and broadband internet. Examples of infrastructure include roads, hospitals and national grids for the supply of utilities such as running water, electricity and natural gas. Infrastructure can be supplied by either the government, so a good example in Britain is most of the schools that we've got uh, were provided by the state, built by the state, or um, infrastructure can be provided by private companies. So a good example of that would be a Euro Tunnel, which was funded via the stock market. Say why it might work. So what we're going to look at here is arguments um, about how infrastructure could create economic growth or economic development. So in a developing country context, infrastructure that makes possible clean running water and sanitation uh, could create development by raising life expectancy. Uh, so the work by charities such as WaterAid or OneWater show that even uh, private um, organisations, uh, in the case of OneWater, a charity, have actually helped to raise life expectancy by providing uh, water infrastructure. Infrastructure spending can also create economic development by improving the quality of the products or services that we consume. So a good example maybe is 5G. You should definitely know about 5G. It's the next generation of wireless network technology that's expected to change the way that people live and work. Allegedly, it will be faster and able to handle more connected devices than the existing 4G network. Much of the hype around 5G is to do with its speed, but there are other benefits too. 5G will have greater bandwidth, meaning it can handle many more connected devices than previous networks. This means no more spotty service when you're in a crowded area, and it'll enable even more connected devices like smart uh, toothbrushes and smart refrigerators that tell you when you're out of milk and um, you know maybe more important things like self-driving cars uh, that's an interesting one would a self-driving car add to society's welfare well i guess if you're going on a long journey you could read a book or something rather than focusing on the road but i guess some people actually quite like driving their car and they gain pleasure from being in control anyway we digress uh, 5g will also reduce something called latency which is the time it takes for a tablet or a cell phone or some other connected device to make a request from a server and get a response. Uh, and this time will go to virtually zero with 5G. And it will make communication with cloud um, platforms um, faster and easier, uh, which is obviously important as more companies go over to cloud-based storage. Infrastructure spending can also increase productivity growth um, and, and therefore create economic growth and therefore economic development. So a, a good example might be HS2. So um, if people can get between Manchester and Birmingham uh, more rapidly, they'll be able to spend more time in the office working. So output per worker will increase, which is what productivity is. And if each worker can now produce more in total, the long run AS will shift out to the right and that will create um, uh, long run economic growth. So you've actually seen um, infrastructure uh, before when we did interventionist supply side policies as part of theme two. So infrastructure spending is just an interventionist supply side policy. So as we've just said, um, Supply side policies are designed to increase long run aggregate supply by increasing output per worker, which is productivity. 
Um, so it, it could be if you improve, for example, the internet so it was faster, that would mean that workers would spend less time waiting for their computers to e uh, execute tasks. So that would allow each worker to get more work done in a day. So that would increase output per worker. So the same workforce would produce more GDP. And that would shift the long run AS to the right. Again, it's all wrapped up in an increase in productivity output per worker. Uh, infrastructure spending typically requires the, the government to finance it. It's an example of public sector capital spending. So government spending is a component of aggregate demand. So um, like any other interventionist supply side policy that works using increases in government spending, it won't just increase LRAS, it will also increase AD2. And as a result of that, we'll get economic growth of MY1 to MY2. So there's your growth. And then you can make some standard arguments through to how growth can affect development in a positive way. So it's, it's very easy. You could say, well, if the economy grows faster than the population, then GDP per capita will increase. And as GNI per capita is a component of the HDI, there will therefore be a recorded increase in development. Keynesians would also argue that infrastructure spending can create positive multiplier effects. Uh, the multiplier describes how an initial increase in government spending can create a final increase in GDP that's many times higher than the initial injection. And the reason why the multiplier effect exists, according to Keynesians, is that the initial injection is respent. So the image shows um, a new cycle path in London and there's some uh, steel barrier there. Uh, there's some new paving stones. So um, firms, private firms will have got that um, those contracts awarded by the government. So they'll have had to take on extra workers um, to increase the output of the steel and the paving stones used on this uh, bike path. So um, they'll also have to take on workers too. Uh, to to meet this increase uh, order from the state. Um, so um, people who were previously unemployed will get jobs. Uh, they'll then spend some of those incomes maybe on other things. It could be bicycles or it could be a new car. Uh, and that will create uh, another rise in GDP. And the firms that produce the bicycles and cars will have to take on people as well more jobs created, more wages created, another round of spending. And so the multiplier effect proceeds. It's um, almost like a dwindling chain of respending. So Keynesians would say, well, infrastructure spending, yes, it, it's beneficial for the supply side of the economy, but it can also create uh, beneficial demand side um, impacts too. Um, that could be particularly important when you're stuck in a recession and uh, consumer and ha um, business confidence are very low. Uh, so a monetary policy is, is, it lo has lost its traction because you're stuck in a liquidity trap. So maybe that would be a good time to go for infrastructure spending as a way of getting aggregate demand up. Another topical one is um, you could argue in favor of uh, infrastructure projects uh, by saying, well, maybe we could actually build green infrastructure. Um, so it could be a tidal barrage uh, that generates electricity. So it's a substitute for maybe a coal or a gas fired power station. So if the state establishes this green infrastructure, um, there, there could be a substitution effect here. So the demand for fossil fuels will go down. And as a result of that, there'll be um, uh, fewer negative externalities produced by burning coal and natural gas. And that might help to improve the quality of life in a way that's sustainable. Um, sustainable development being uh, a situation where the quality of life for the current generation improves without it compromising the ability of future generations to achieve a similarly high quality of life. So. Um, this is again, is a, as I say, is a very, very topical sort of theme really at the moment. A lot of it traces back to UN uh, Agenda 21, which you should do some research on. You could also argue that infrastructure spending can help to lift growth and development by improving a country's international competitiveness. 
uh, making export lad economic growth possible. So you improve transport networks, for example, or you improve ed educational infrastructure, you improve broadband, um, maybe productivity improves, um, that reduces unit labour costs um, if the rate of productivity growth is higher than the, the rate at which nominal wages are advancing. And if firms have got lower unit labour costs, they'll be able to cut their prices without compromising their profit margins and then hopefully undercut firms operating abroad in export markets that you'd like to conquer. Say why it might not work. So what we're going to look at here is um, the downsides of infrastructure spending, why it might fail to lift growth, why it might fail to trigger economic development. So the, the first argument is, is very much an Austrian school one. So will the government spend um, the money, the, the capital expenditure on infrastructure wisely? Uh, Austrians would argue that central planners are too remote. They don't have enough information to decide which infrastructure projects should get the go ahead and, and which shouldn't. Um, you could also uh, quote public choice theory as well. Will central planners actually be making those decisions on the basis of what's best for society? Or will they be making those decisions on the basis of what's best for them? So, you know, if that was the case, they would select infrastructure projects with uh, crony firms that they've got contacts with, push big contracts by the way of those big firms. Uh, and in return, they're going to get a lucrative non-exec job uh, when their political career ends. So Austrians would say, well, uh, public sector capital expenditure on infrastructure sounds really great, but will the money be spent wisely? Another drawback of investing heavily in infrastructure is that public sector capital spending can cause what's called crowding out. Crowding out describes a process by which uh, an attempt to grow the economy by expanding the public sector backfires and rather than GDP rising, it actually falls. And it falls because the expansion of public sector output causes a much bigger fall in private sector output. So um, the transmission mechanism for this, if we just sort of quickly go through it, um, if the government wants to build more infrastructure, then typically this is done by running fiscal deficits. So if you want more infrastructure spending, you'll have to run bigger fiscal deficits. Governments finance fiscal deficits by selling bonds. So if you want to run a bigger fiscal deficit, you'll need to sell more bonds. Uh, bonds are bought by uh, the private sector using loanable funds. So if more of society's finite loanable funds are going to the government to finance uh, public sector capital spending, there, there won't be as many loanable funds left for the private sector to borrow. So that shortage of loanable funds uh, leads to a fall in private sector investment. So you get an increase in public sector investment, but the opportunity cost of that is a fall in private sector investment. So you might ask, well, won't that just uh, cancel each other out? Well, the answer is no, um, because private sector investment will tend to have a lower capital output ratio. That's because firms in the private sector are more efficient. Uh, they're better decision makers, are entrepreneurs because it's their money at stake. Uh, in contrast, the public sector is run by politicians. Uh, politicians are less likely to be effective decision makers because they're playing with other people's money. Uh, they don't have personal financial skin in the game. They're just playing with taxpayers' money, so who cares? So actually, if you create a situation where public sector capital spending goes up at the expense of a fall in private sector uh, capital expenditure, then what you'll get is a fall in the rate of growth of GDP because um, private sector investment pound for pound will create much bigger increases in GDP than public sector investment. A related argument is that expensive programmes of state infrastructure spending will eventually um, damage living standards one way or another via tax increases. 
Um, so Keynesians will say, oh, no, 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 that's wrong, um, because the government could finance infrastructure spending uh, without having to put taxes up, um, obviously by running fiscal deficits. Um, so taxes might not go up immediately, but the problem of running fiscal deficits year after year after year to fund public sector capital investment in infrastructure is that your national debt will start growing. And as your national debt grows every single year, the government's spending on debt interest will grow. You know, the bigger the national debt, the more that the government will have to spend on debt interest, ceteris paribus. So even if the government does finance infrastructure spending by running fiscal deficits and increasing the national debt, eventually taxes will have to rise to pay for the extra government spending on debt interest that occurs every single year. So in summary, then what we're saying here is that infrastructure spending can actually damage li living standards because ordinary households have got reduced disposable incomes because their tax rates go up. Um, because there's no such thing as a free lunch in economics. Somebody's going to have to pay for these programs of state infrastructure spending and that will leave households worse off. And then we come back to this old argument again is uh, of rather um, who's best place to spend your money? Who's going to do a better job of maximising your utility with your limited money income? Uh, should you be empowered to spend your money? that you've earned helping others yourself? Or should that job be outsourced to some wonderful central planner who knows your own unique tastes and preferences better than you do? You know, obviously from my perspective, this just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, high taxes effectively confiscate spending votes from people who know their own tastes and preferences way better than any central planner who can only second guess them. And that's assuming that the central planner really even does have the interests of the taxpayer at heart rather than their own interests at heart. Say what it depends on. So what, what, what does the effectiveness of infrastructure spending depend on? Again, this is another way of scoring evaluation. So uh, an obvious one is the competency or otherwise of the central planners who are making the infrastructure spending decisions and are they are, who are they serving basically are they serving the electorate or are they serving the big corporations that put them into power that let's put it in polite terms that maybe made big party political donations Another say what it depends on factor would be the power of any fiscal multiplier effect created by public sector capital spending. So the higher the multiplier value, uh, the bigger the increase in aggregate demand caused by any given injection of spending on infrastructure. You could also argue it depends on the country and its stage of development. So um, if you've got a country that doesn't have any schools, or doesn't have any internet at all, then that type of infrastructure spending, building uh, schools and broadband networks and running water, uh, makes an awful lot of sense. If you've already got those systems and you're just upgrading them, maybe the sort of social rates of return on those investments are less impressive. And the final um, say what it depends on point again is, it depends on your economic perspective. So if you're a Keynesian, you believe in the power of government, um, you, you think that there's market failure all over the place, you, you think that the private sector is incapable of providing good quality infrastructure. So you'll be a big fanboy of um, government spending on infrastructure. On the other hand, if you're uh, an Austrian economist who favours Hayek and Mises, uh, then you'll be very, very critical of um, infrastructure spending. You would argue that the private sector uh, can fund it. And also uh, because the private sector has to make a profit to survive, they're more likely to be responsive to sovereign consumers and provide them with the right type of infrastructure. The right type of infrastructure being the type of infrastructure that sovereign consumers want. 
which is likely to or which may or may not be different from the type of infrastructure that central planners want. Um, you know, this obviously brings me on to another point as well, that, that the problem with government is that politicians have ego. So they might decide to blow um, taxpayers' money on some crazy infrastructure project as, as some sort of a personal vanity issue, you know, building a big international airport that they're going to name after themselves. Um, that's going to be a monument to them um, when they're dead. Um, this sort of stuff is, um, I suppose you could call it, it's a form of corruption, I guess. Um, and I would just say, keep taxes low, let people choose what they want to spend their money on. And uh, firms will spot needs for infrastructure as they emerge and uh, they'll have an incentive to do that um, because if people really want infrastructure um, they'll cast their spending votes in favour of it.